First a disclaimer, I am not a Patriots fan, but I apparently made a bet yesterday and lost. So I am wearing a Patriots jersey for Mike Martin over here. So, <laughs> um, so this is SEO Q&A. So basically you guys can just line up with the mic, ask any SEO questions that you have. If it requires us to look anything up, Mike will come up and look it up. Um, I am going to let Mike and Kenny introduce themselves, or Kenny and then Mike introduce themselves, and then I'll go last. I'm Kenny Hyder. I run a SEO consultancy called Hyder Media. We focus mainly on uh, high competition level um, SEO clients. Uh, and I'm Michael Martin. I'm the Patriots fan. I'm originally from uh, the Boston area, but now um, and I'm the SEO manager over at Cavario in San Diego. It's a little warmer, about the same as here today, but um, we deal with like SEO and the paid for Fortune 500 companies. And also I specialize in mobile and write uh, for mobile for search engine land. So if you guys have questions in general for SEO, Kenny's the man, and anything as far as like mobile, I can maybe pitch in a few cents, maybe a nickel. <laughs> uh, my name's Ray Hoffman. Uh, I go online by Sugar Ray. I am the, well, I'm a career affiliate. I've been an affiliate for, I think, at least the last 12 years now. Um, I was solely an affiliate until I opened up an agency called Pushfire, and we do SEO consulting, um, pay-per-click management, and link building for medium to fortune-sized companies. So if anybody has any questions, now would be the time to go up and ask. <laughs> Just come up to the mic and uh, fire away. Come on. She's getting there. Oh, I couldn't see her on this thing. Hi, guys. Um, okay, so... Um, Panda and all this hoo-ha. <laughs> I have a website that I developed like a while ago now, and I really just um, fed it with a heap of feeds, and it was a while ago. And um, I've inserted like webmaster tools and so on, and, and to be honest, I mean, everybody's talking about like how you shouldn't put data from feeds directly from affiliates and so on like that, but this site seems to be going really well. I've not touched it in like three years. And I'm just like wondering, okay, like how, how, uh, how does it define, like when you do pull data from XML feeds from affiliate networks and so on, I mean like I, I was actually thinking of taking time and optimizing and rewriting all my content and you know the length of certain posts. I know this is really vague because you don't know the site, but I mean how, how valid is this whole pulling of data from, you know, from the provided sources from, from affiliate net networks and so on? So um, I know, I know both, both of them looked right at me. Um, <laughs> I build a lot of data feed sites. So um, typically, you know, I'm going to tell you that if you're ranking really well post Panda with a straight up affiliate data feed site, you either have some really strong links or you're just in a, a niche it's, where you are an really exception to a general I, rule. I asked the guys at Google because uh, uh, I attended a, you know, a conference and um, and they were just like, no, you need to kind of like remove all those pages immediately. And every time I look at like, it's my best performing site in webmaster tools. And I'm just like, why? If, if, if it's so bad, why is it performing like this? You know, it's. There, there's a lot of different factors that could be at play. I mean, it depends on when the affiliate data feed came out. If you jumped on it and you were the first person who, the first affiliate that published it, and then you were the first person to get really strong links after you published it, it's possible Google thinks you're the originator of the content, so your site does fine, but anybody else that tried to use that exact feed would experience problems, okay. um, or might experience problems. I'm not gonna say 100% they would. Um, as far as uniquing data feeds, I mean, a lot of it is, um, if you can spit out the information in a different order than people typically spit it out. Um, you know, the other thing is too, is that a lot of times we'll do an additional scraping for what we call box information. Um, so it's basically anything that you could get off the side of a manufacturer box that's not um, basically copyrighted content. We'll scrape the merchant site to pull that information so that we have additional information in addition to what they've given us into the affiliate data feed. Um, we'll also add in features for like related products. So if you like this product from this category, we'll show three products from a related I think category. I've done that with, a, with some kind of integration actually. So I, 
Because really and truly, I've done nothing for this site apart also from a lot of feeds for ages ago. Like, yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just saying from a best practices standpoint, I, when we do data feeds, I'm that's that's how it. we do it. I stopped the data feeds because obviously I, I realized that I shouldn't like shouldn't be doing building a site like that. And I thought like, okay, well, it seems to be going well. Maybe I should just continue doing them. But I've I've always hesitated now because I'm just I don't know how the response is going to be now because this was about. About three years ago that I that, that I did that. I, I, I love building affiliate data feed sites. It's just uniquing the content. And again, you, you have something going on there where you're an exception to a rule with a data feed site. And like I said, there's a bunch of things that, that could be the cause of that. Um, but if you do a search in Google for uh, uh, using uh, affiliate data feeds, um, I have a whole post on my site about okay. uh, basically avoiding, du if you search avoiding duplicate content with data feeds, you'll find it. And so right. I have a whole post on how to avoid duplicate content and how to unique a data feed. So that may help. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks. And if we could just take a step back, um, just to uh, highlight what she actually said early on is, is everyone familiar when she says panda, are you probably going to hear panda and penguin? Has everyone heard about that beyond what you see at a zoo? As far as it, as far as relates for SEO, yes or no? <laughs> okay. But some people said no. Do you want do you want to take a step back and just ex give a yeah? Brief go ahead. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, well, just as, as in very simple terms, um, really these two panda and penguin are the names of of not really an update but filtering that Google has done in the past year. Panda is more about content duplication of content where say like the demand medias and the e-house of how to drink water, just creating content to create content, were stymied. While Penguin was more about a authenticity of, of links. So Panda's content, and, and, and there's nuances to it, but Panda's content, Penguin, is about links. Basically, Panda was trying to go after sites with crappy content, and Penguin's trying to go after sites with crappy links. And what's cool little trivia is, do you, do you notice the commonality between the two as well? Black and white animals. Black and white animals. So that's why the next one's probably going to be zebra. That's the prediction. <laughs> Hi. Um, I know that the SEO world has changed, and I'm trying to figure out how to best phrase this question. Let's say I have an affiliate site about corporate gift baskets, and I've got several pages, and I've got affiliate links, and I've got all the rest of this stuff. Just to cut to the chase, how do you get good rankings for something like that today? Because in the old days, they would say, build some kind of a link wheel, get all kinds of inbound links. In the old, old days, they would say, comment on blogs. They would do all this kind of stuff. And apparently, Google has come down hard on a lot of these crappy links and everything. And yet, somebody is going to be near the top. And, and please don't tell me, oh, just write wonderful comment, everybody, <laughs> content, and everybody will come. There's only so much even William Shakespeare could write about corporate gift baskets. So right. what is it that you have to do if you want to be near the top of something well, I th like that? I think that? the way you have to kind of think about it, and it, and it relates to uh, also the last question. You know, currently we're kind of like in this big state of flux, you know, and, and everything's kind of gray and no one knows exactly why some of the things are working that they are. And that's, I mean, that's pretty common every time Google goes through major changes. And, you know, basically the question you have to ask is, uh, as a user, why would you want to see your own site? You know, are you offering something that's unique and relevant to a point that you know you would have people that would come back and bookmark your site um, and have that kind of uh, presence where instead of just having information about corporate gift baskets or you know having product listings and you know all of that kind of stuff, that you can find those in a lot of places. Why, as an affiliate, would you? What are you providing to your users that's better than them just going straight to um, you know the the manufacturer and buying buying them. Mind you, there's a lot of sites out there that do you know like uh, coupon discounts and stuff, and they basically take the affiliate commissions and pass that savings on, which is why those sites are really successful. You know, big sites like Ebates and and things like that. Um, but if you're just an affiliate selling a product, why should someone buy it from you rather than anyone else that p might potentially rank? And that's kind of I think what Google is really looking to do is in why we're seeing a lot of volatility with you know, affiliate sites and a lot of different niches that people compete in those spaces is, well, what are we providing those people by, you know, letting them rank high rather than having them, you know, being outranked by other, you know, larger corporations or, or websites or whatever. 
So as an affiliate, it's, you know, it, it, it isn't just, you know, write good content and people will come. That's, you know, that's a, sometimes that works for the right thing maybe or whatever, but really what, why is your site better than anyone else's where they're going to find these products? The, 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 the unpopular answer is like, just frankly, you have to build a better site nowadays. Um, so it's kind of like you said, corporate gift baskets, right? So how do you differentiate a corporate, get corporate gift basket site, you know, an affiliate site from every other site? And I mean, you can do things like build a reminder engine, um, so that people can put in, you know, birthdays, employees, birthdays, et cetera, so that it automatically will send a corporate gift basket every single year. Um, you can do a special search feature so that people can find, find gift baskets based on, you know, price, uh, topic, et cetera, um, letting consumers put reviews in there I mean if, if the site is a site WordPress based yeah yeah so there there's there's a my review plugin which is a plugin that you can use with WordPress that gives you the ability for consumers to leave reviews um, you can run contests to be able to get yourself a little bit more visible on social media and the reason for that is not because I give a crap about the social media links I don't care about the links from Twitter um, but I do care about the signals that it sends to the Google toolbar that people are actually visiting your site and then the other thing is too is that when you do actually produce decent content on your own site the bigger your social following the more of a chance that that content is going to be shared. Um, and then also, like, you know, I, I still really like guest blogging. By guest blogging, I don't mean writing a 300 word post that's on a default WordPress template site that's between Viagra and personal injury attorneys. I mean, actually going out to, um, you know, sites that are for small business owners and offering them, you know, offering to do an article for them on ways to impress clients. And only one of the ways has to do with you. One of the ways is to remember your client's birthdays and to send them a corporate gift basket, um, you know, and put yourself in the bio line if possible, get your, your link in the content. Um, but, you know, it, it just comes down to you kind of have to put effort into it. And I'm, I'm talking from the SEO aspect, not the PPC Well, this is, aspect, it's related so. though. This is, I mean, that's basically what she's saying is build something that's better than, yep. you know, if you have a reminder built into your site that makes it more convenient, that's a, res a resource that people are going to, you know, want to use. That's, it, it's more philosophical what I was saying, you know, build something that is more unique and everything. But that's, I mean, this is a great example of that, I would say. You know, it's, it's just, I'm trying to think how to put this. <clears throat> If I went to a business consultant and I had a bricks and mortar store and, you know, I'm trying to sell clothing and I asked a consultant, well, how can I get people to come to my store? And he says, well, you know, just have a better store than everybody else. Yeah, that, that's but But a valid thing would be if you had better customer service. Um, it's the same thing like if you have a restaurant, right? You can have great food and lots of restaurants have great food, but if they've got crappy service, nobody's going to come back. So there, there's, it's, it's in that analogy, it would be, you know, not necessarily build a better store, um, but, you know, having good customer service, having nice decor, making sure that the way that you have the site set up makes sense so that people can find things and they're not frustrated walking around. Um, you know, looking for things that they can't find, etc. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the trust me, I, I miss the days of throwing 100 sites up at a time um, and 90 of them ranking. Uh, it's, it's harder with an affiliate site now, but I, I tell people all the time that you, you really have to find a point of difference. Um, and the point of difference is unfortunately is the hard thing. If, if it were easy to come up with a point of difference, then everybody would do it. And um, so it's kind of, again, I have a post on my blog called How to Survive the Affiliate Evolution, and that has a lot in there about creating a point of difference and differentiating yourself for the new kind of affiliate sites. Just a disclaimer too, I wrote that post in 2006, but I think it still is relevant today as it was then. Okay, I won't hog the mic here anymore, but I, I would be interested in any, if you have any insight into like if the old days, what influenced Google was, and again, I'm not talking about subjective things like who's got the nicest site, but like in the, in the old days, inbound links were pretty much the king. And oh, links are still, still are. the king. Yeah, absolutely. You just have to get better quality links than you were able to get before. You know, you have to get quality links from sites that have traffic that are established authorities in a relevant area and get those links. And by, no, by authorities, no. we don't mean the CNN.com. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll take a link right. from CNN.com. Uh, but, you know, authorities Sites that aren't just niche, existing for purpose of links or, you know, having content on the Internet, you know, but... Links still absolutely rule, and you know that's a, a big part of all of our strategies, I'm sure. So, uh, you know that's def that's definitely part of you know the ranking game. Still, it's just uh, you can't throw up a thin affiliate site and have just some affiliate links, and then you know get 
a couple of quality links and, st and rank, you have to have both pieces. You have to have the links and you have to have the quality, you know, content driven, unique proposition of a website first, you know, and then that's how you get the good links also, you know, it kind of works together. I don't want to belabor this point, but I think this, this actually hits on a key question for a lot of the people here. Um, and also to echo what was said here as far as what is your niche? Like what, why would I purchase through you? Is it, are you the cheapest? Are you the best? Are you, do you have some certain niche? And that kind of answers, will answer a general question for everybody. Uh, you know, I'd have to think about that, but I'm thinking for the benefit of the people in the room rather than it being about me, maybe another way to phrase the question, then I'll just sit down. If you, you folks are SEOS experts. If I came to you with any kind of a site, doesn't matter what it is, and I just said, okay, I'm going to give you each 100 grand, get me as high up in the Google rankings as you can get. Well, uh, what would you do? Well, I, w I won't take on clients unless I think it's a relevant fit and I think they have a decent chance of accomplishing the goals that they want to accomplish because otherwise it's going to reflect poorly on me if I take on clients that just have money to throw around and then, you know, I'm not able to get them anywhere. Then what happens, you know, maybe they come and stand up and say, oh, this guy didn't do what he said he was going to do. You know, that's uh, so I know from I mean, for me personally, I, I look for relevancy in my clients as far as, you know, the, the type of clients and, and areas that I compete. And then also, you know, I don't, I don't have any affiliates as clients because, you know, I, well, one, it's kind of a philosophy Ray told me, why would you, I mean, if you could be an affiliate and provide what they're doing, why would you have them pay you to do it? You know what I mean? Uh, so all of my clients are all, you know, a, a brand of some sort that has brick and mortar presence. Usually, you know, it's in, and that, that's kind of how I approach it is I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't take you on as a client if you were just coming at me with, you know, large numbers, it's, it'd be nice for, you know, a couple months or whatever, but then I have to own up to what happens, you know. I think, I think the core of, of what's changed is, you know, back in the day, it was fairly, you know, at the, at the time, I don't think we realized how easy it was, but back in the day, it was much easier to rank. Um, and so basically, you would put up a brand new website, then you would rank it in Google, then the website would become popular because it ranked in Google. Um, and I think what Google did was Google was like, no, no, that's, that's not what we were trying to do. What we were trying to do was find the popular sites and then rank them, not rank sites and then have them become popular. Um, so it, it essentially, that, that's the biggest thing that's changed. So if, you know, if I were to take uh, any, anybody's, even when I do my own affiliate sites, when we launch our, you know, we, I still build affiliate sites regardless of the fact that I, I now also own an agency. So when we build our affiliate sites, you know, we take that money and we disperse it. Um, as broadly as possible and what, what, what we spend it on is marketing. I don't care if that marketing is PPC marketing. I don't care if that marketing is doing guest blogging on, you know, other people's sites to get people aware of us. Uh, you know, it may be running contests. It may be running the wildfire app to get social proof up on Facebook so we have more people following us. Um, it may be, you know, investing in a design that converts higher, but we, we spend the money basically to try and make, my general theory is, and I know that this, I know that this isn't an easy answer, so it, it sucks sometimes to have to give it, but basically I try and build a website um, and then market the website so that it ranks in Google because it deserves to rank and not necessarily trying to find a loophole to get it to rank in Google. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. And just to come, come full circle to the, to the point I was trying to make in, in a general sense, when it's, it's not just about links anymore, the key to the game now, like say, let's say for instance you're uh, deal at the luxury end. What you do is the whole integration of social, the social links in them, of themselves aren't critical directly for ranking, but indirectly because those are the affirmation signals the search engines are looking for. And the reality is, say, for, for affiliate sites, how do things get passed? Do people really link to affiliate sites? Yes. Not really. Well, not really. It's, it's not, if you're going to pass along and say you find a great deal, no, here's the real deal, is, and what Google's doing is, is using the dark social. You don't necessarily tweet about a great deal. You maybe do or a Facebook post. But most of it, when you're getting, sending it to friends, what are you doing? You're IMing it, you're emailing it. What's the popular e IM? G, G talk still, uh, getting there. And Gmail. Google is using these dark social because that is where the real conversions are. That's where the real communication on purchasing um, items are. And it's that affirmation with that dark social beyond the, the fluffy social, Twitter and everything else, other than echoing it in G+. Uh, is how Google can get that affirmation socially to validate those links on the sites. And that's what we're seeing, and that's how to be ahead of the curve on what, what it is. It's not just links, not just content. That's a very generalized answer. Uh, 
different topic. I uh, do a lot of affiliate marketing, yes, and design sites for affiliate marketers. But I also do a lot of web design for e-commerce sites as well. And I was wondering about uh, template-driven e-commerce sites uh, and how that can impact negatively with your SEO rankings, uh, specifically oh. um, <coughs> e-commerce sites like BigCommerce. Um, and well, we all know, we all love WordPress. That's a given. But then, what about some of those other smaller ones out there that I've used? And I guess the main question is, template-driven sites for e-commerce is that good or bad for? Well, the, I've, I, uh, I don't do a whole lot of e-commerce anymore, but I did uh, several years ago. I consulted for quite a number of large e-commerce retailers. And um, the problems with, uh, you know, the systems is a lot of them, you know, you have to really research and make sure that you, they're not going to enforce any limitations on you. Even, uh, you know, I've seen s some systems that will, you know, require, you know, that they append certain things to your title tags. And, you know, it's a very large hack to get it to you know, work around these kinds of things. So I think that, I mean, basically what I would be looking for, and I'm not, you know, necessarily familiar with the exact ones that you might be looking at, but, um, you know, what I would do is if you just look at the, like the Google SEO guide, Google has like a beginner SEO guide, and all of the things that they say in there, they're pretty general. Like, I mean, you know, if you have a good sense of SEO, you'll, you know, all of the things that they say there will make sense and, you know, kind of be no-brainers. Um, but any of those things that they're saying, you know, that you need to pay attention to, like uh, inbound links, uh, internal links, title tags, descriptions, you know, load times, all of these kinds of things, um, if there's any limitations for that, you need to really research and see what's it going to take to, you know, work around that or, you know, how much time is it going to take to break this, you know, site. Because a lot of them, you know, when you try to change those things, then they're not compatible with updates and, you know, all of that. And then you leave yourself open to vulnerabilities, which you absolutely don't want to be doing because that's what you know, spammers look for is insecurities in these systems so that they can inject stuff onto websites. I've seen it a half a dozen times. So really, you, know, you just want to make sure that you have complete control to be able to you know, modify or change or you know, do whatever you need to do on a granular level page to page because uh, you know, especially you know, with e-commerce, the sites tend to be large in nature and you have lots and lots of pages, hundreds of thousands of pages sometimes. And when you can't change you know, a title tag structure for 20,000 pages, that could mean indexation problems for, you know, a, a large portion of your, your uh, content on your site. So you just want to make sure that you have that kind of control. What about, would I, would I ever run into an issue with, I call it HTML fluff. Uh, when you ever use a, a web builder or something like that, you tend to have Coding. Way too much code. Yeah. It's just over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's so pretty common. I mean, you're going to have that t to some degree with anything. I mean, even with WordPress, you have problems with that. And WordPress is pretty lean. You know what I mean? But that's, you know, the, the I would say that's kind of like a secondary thing to look at because, uh, you know, if you get locked into some system, and these, I mean, a lot of them are, are pretty expensive. You know, you're, it's not like you can just go through a couple of them and see which one you like. Right. You know what I mean? So you have to be careful to... Uh, make sure that the way, you know, have an, uh, an idea of your site before you, you know, don't implement to the system, implement the system to your site so that you have, so that you know what you need to be able to do. And if these, you know, if there's going to be major limitations or you're going to have to do a bunch of workarounds, you know, kind of do some cost analysis on that at first. And I mean, you're going to have to hack any, I mean, if you're using some <coughs> other software that's, you know, a template type software, you're going to have to hack it at least a little bit. You know, but you need to, I would really do a little bit of research and dig into, okay, what do we want our site to look like? What's our architecture going to look like? You know, how does everything need to happen? And then, which is the most adaptable system for your specific needs? So some, some things from an SEO perspective that you need to look out for with large e-commerce sites. Um, one of the big ones is if they're the merchant and they're the originator, make sure that they're not giving an exact duplicate of their feed to affiliates if they do have affiliates for their, their merchant program. I don't care, like give the affiliates one feed and let all of them figure out how to unique it. But for the merchant, make sure that they do not give them the exact duplicate of their feed. Because if they were to give an affiliate like me that, and I build a website and I make my website stronger than their website, I'm gonna outrank them for their own products. Um, one of the other things is uh, big e-commerce sites typically tend to have a lot of duplicate content issues that are easily fixed with a canonical tag. So sorting, um, there should be one primary way that's indexed 
to sort it. And so if you're sorting by price and you're sorting by popularity and you're sorting by uh, you know size or what ha whatever you're sorting by, pick one basic way to sort. That's the way that you feed the search engines and you make sure that all the rest of the, the ways that you can sort have canonical tags pointing back. I honestly would prefer mod rewrite, but um, I, I don't like to leave anything up to Google, but canonical is much easier, especially if you're not uh, really high up on code. Um, also, speed typically is a big deal. Make sure that the images are uh, compressed. Uh, compressed. That's an issue for not only from an SEO aspect, also from a user aspect. Nobody wants to sit there and wait 12 seconds for your page to load. Um, we are very much, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the, the skit by uh, Louis C.K., but he's talking about how somebody looks at their cell phone and they're like, oh, Ah, and he's like, will you give it a second? It's going to space. Like people <laughs> expect things to load immediately. Um, also, as far as templating, Google can tell what a navigation is. So they know what a sidebar is. They know what a footer is. So don't worry so much about duplication. That goes for everybody. Don't worry so much about duplication in your actual site design and layout. Worry more about the, the internal content. Um, also, I, I would always, always, always add a review functionality. It just, help keeps this, it just helps to keep the site a little bit different than anybody else that may be similar. Um, and also, depending on the product, I also like to add social shares to the individual product pages. So, I mean, like, if you're a urinary incontinence site, no, not so much. I doubt people are going to, like, share that on Twitter. I have built one. But, yeah, <laughs> but if you, if you have products, like, you know, if you're a Think Geek, like, you absolutely should have social shares buttons on it so that people can share the stuff when they do find it. And that helps give you the social signals that Mike was talking about as far as, um, you know, kind of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a, a credit card application affiliate site and we did well with organic rankings for a while and when Panda Penguin came out, uh, we had to switch over to writing content. We've written a lot of on-site content. We've also created uh, social media pages with a fairly good stream of posts and um, I'm still not getting the traction I'm looking for so I'm just wondering where you guys would, we write about 15,000 words of uh, content a month or more. So I'm just wondering where you guys would put in the emphasis between purging, you know, questionable or bad links, um, doing posts off-site on sites, doing article exchanges, um, more social media posts. I just, did I'll you, hear from my SEO, all those things are good. And Did you get any alerts in Webmaster Tools? Uh, yeah, we go around and we pretty much fix those as we go, all the duplicate pages. Yeah, we it's going to be real hard to get back uh, to seeing those rankings like you did before because I've um, you know, done a lot of work in the credit card payday industry and uh, online financials and those sites right now, I mean those application sites that are affiliates, Google knows who you are and they know what you're doing and they don't like it mm -hmm. and it's going to be really, really hard to get back to anywhere, especially if you do, were doing any kind of link stuff that you knew you shouldn't have been doing before. Mm -hmm. I mean that you're going to basically have to, you know, annihilate all your links and start over and create something that looks different and feels different and has, you know, everything. It's like they really don't like you as far as you know showing up in results. They don't like to to have these application sites ranking anymore, especially in anything financial. Um, so you're going to have to really, you know, basically good luck because it's going to be it's it's I've I've seen a couple of sites that are struggling with the same kind of thing in payday and uh, there's no hope in sight for them right now, especially if you've already gotten alerts for duplicate content or links <laughs> or anything or any combination of those type of alerts after Penguin and Penguin came out. Uh, yeah, we've cleaned those up, um, all the ones we know about anyway. Right, right. Except you, for some of the bad links, I guess you go through a purge process where you ask them to remove you and if they don't remove you, you yeah, will. You yeah, they have the tool, the disavow tool now, so you'll have to, I mean, I'm being told that takes a long time. You it, have to ask the webmaster a couple times and then Google finally can report them as... Well, in, in my experience, um, I've done a couple of, uh, you know, I've had a couple of clients over the years that uh, hired me because they got penalized or banned or something and then they hired me to help them clean up and everything. And, um, you know, I, I, I go through every single link that I can find and the ones that I don't want, I contact the sites manually, you know, over the phone or email or whatever I have to do. And I go through every link and try and get it removed off the site before now. And, you know, I use the disavow as like a backup basically, but you, you know, you need to actually go get all these links removed by hand. You need to clean up all of that stuff and disavow everything else and then redesign the site and put up, you know, take down all the old stuff that was there and put up all brand new. It's like, 
you have to basically start over because those specifically those type of sites that you're talking about with the app, you know online applications are they're targeted now, very heavily right that, now. That's also assuming though that you did indeed get hit for like for having crap links right. by Penguin. Um, my question for you would be how far did you drop? Where were you and where are you now? Uh, you know, we kept our number one keyword. Uh, it was all the keywords that were starting to come up and it crept from like page eight to page three to page two. You know, we had 30 new keywords that hadn't been ranked and then those all fell down. How long and, has it been since they were on the uh, second page and they aren't anymore? I guess anymore? we got hit in August and then maybe again in October and now we've crept our way back again. Uh, we've gone and gotten rid of some <coughs> duplicate internal links that weren't great and um, so I, I'd be careful with anchor text oversaturation. Like I, I would, I would yeah. check how many, how many direct hit keywords you have linking okay. to those pages, um, especially if you see them drop. Uh, the other thing that I, I would say is, you know, credit cards is hard because I know from like the, the credit card site that we have, the banks are like really, really picky about the credit card information. So it's actually like one of the industries where you almost can't rewrite the data feed. So you've got to figure out because the data feed has to be an exact wording um, for what the, the bank wants. Um, and then the other question that I would have for you is like, how bad were your links? Are, are we talking you had some paid links or are we talking uh, like we, we you had, were injecting we, WordPress sites? We, we had a SEO company that just really built links and then we got rid of them. But we got a report that said, here's some links that are toxic because these websites aren't even registered. They're not even indexed in Google. That was like maybe 70 of them. Then we've got maybe... So that, report, that report came from the, the it former came from agency, our, right? Our SEO. Somehow. Yeah, no names, but it came from the former agency, right? No, um, that came from our, our new agency. Right, okay, no, but it came from an agency. I'm saying you didn't yeah, get an, an email from Google saying you no, had crappy no, links. No, we got it from our agency. Then there's a larger group that are questionable, maybe a couple hundred, and then we probably have another couple hundred that are good. So you have less than 1,000 links total? Well, from one site we, that was a questionable one, we had 20,000 links from that <laughs> yeah. one site. So yeah, get now, rid of I mean, that. individual right. root domains. I, 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 considering you're still on the second page, um, I, I would really check your anchor text to make sure that you're not yeah. hitting the keywords too Make hard. sure your brand name has the most occurrences of links pointing to your domain okay. by far than any other key phrase or, or anchor text match phrase that you're looking for. And, and how can you tell when you're oversaturated? I mean, uh, I, mean you, I use Majestic, uh, Majestic SEO for uh, links. I mean, there's a number of uh, link, you know, tools out there that will crawl and, and give you a report of all the links that they can find. Yeah, Open Site Explorer will do it as well. Um, and then, like, it, it, it's just one of those things where if you have, like, for instance, and I use this as an example a lot, uh, Dell ranks for computers, right? Mm -hmm. 90% of Dell's links do not say computers. Um, they say Dell, they say here, they say new comp, they say, so like anything over 50%, like I would be <coughs> concerned, especially if where you're seeing, especially remember it's not just to the root domain too, so you may have a thousand links to your root domain, but if every single link that you have to these sub pages that are coming up and going back down and coming up and going back mm -hmm. down are all keyword based, that's an issue. So uh, make sure that they have some natural anchor text in there, but that, that, that to me sounds like, like I, I really would take a look at your anchor text. Great, great. And the other thing I'm being told is um, post some things, you know, do article exchanges, guest blogging, all that kind of stuff, and you know, we do, three different social media platforms, Google+, Plus, Twitter, and uh, Facebook, and we do at least one post a day on each of those, and I don't know how much mileage that's gonna get me. I'm being told it's a good thing, but. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, some, those are some of the basics. I mean, what we do, if, like we, it's easier because we do, say like Bank of America, Chase, and Wells, but say on your end, you could probably do, you can maybe get away with this in that, if I may ask, what, what college did you go to? I went to UM, University of Maryland. Okay, so like say just by having that kind of connection, maybe you could give those alumni or students currently there some discount or something. Um, thus you can get direct leads and then you can start getting some, some EDU type links and maybe start spreading out that network. I mean, it's a lot easier direct from the bank, like BOA can do that directly, mm -hmm. but as an affiliate, maybe that's a start. Um, but that kind, of, that kind of groundwork that shows that, hey, you're the real deal, as opposed to just churning out articles and just posting things, again, getting away from the demand media approach, just creating it for the sake of creating it, mm -hmm. that mileage right. doesn't vary, it just, 
you're just like kind of roadrunner, just like in the same, you're just spinning your wheels but not going anywhere. Right. Also social too, like people are more likely to share things that are actually fun to share. Mm -hmm. um, so like maybe if you did something like a reduce your debt challenge and so people sign up to take the challenge and they're gonna reduce their debt over the next three months and you know, then they write in their story and let you know what they did to reduce their debt and how much they reduced it and you pick the best story and give them a thousand dollars towards paying down their debt. Um, you know, and, and make part of, you know, let them know that they need to tweet it or they need to like it on Facebook, um, you know, to officially enter and then just have a form at the end of the three months mm -hmm. where they go and fill out the, the story. But do, doing things like that where you're not necessarily you know, it sucks because, like, no, you're probably not going to get a ton of signups for credit cards through that, but you will get a lot of social indicators. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably get some links out of it. So um, stuff like that, just not doing the regular run-of-the-mill right. stuff. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, how to do a black hat and gray hat SEO nowadays? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, no. Um, I, I, it took me the longest time to convince Google that I don't do that stuff anymore. So um, yeah, definitely not gonna, no, not going there, sorry. Um, it's, it's kind of like, like basically, Anything that you do black hat, like there's a guy years ago that, that used to say all the time that every black hat he knew could white hat, their, white hat their asses off. The only difference is that they basically take what works white hat and figure out ways to automate it. Um, you know, it, de it depends on how much you're, you're talking black hat. I mean, there's two different types of black hat. There is the black hat that Google likes you to believe that every black hat is, which is, you know, they all hack WordPress and inject links. Um, you know, that's somebody doing something illegal, not necessarily a black hat. Um, and then there's just finding loopholes for the algorithm. I mean, I, I did that aspect of things for a long time. Um, and it used to be we would throw 100 sites up and 90 would stick and then it was 80 would stick and then it was 70. And when I hit 40, I was like, okay, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm moving to doing legitimate sites. So at this point, I don't, I don't do much more black anyway and I wouldn't want to give out what my friends who do right, no. tell me. So I'm sorry. Because, um, well, you said automation would be like I think doing uh, white hat automated, but uh, you cannot automate uh, writing quality articles. Uh, and and that, that, that's why the number went can. from 90 yes. sticking to 40 sticking, and, and that, that's why I decided to just go so the route of building. You can automate guys, quality articles, articles, you just have to know. pay writers. Sorry? Just, you just have to pay writers. That's, you know, automation for the content and everything is hire some people that cost less to work than you do and then get them to write for you, you know, that kind of stuff. It was years ago, somebody said on a forum, the new button pushing is people pushing. Right. I can't remember who said that, but. Okay, thanks. Hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little tall. Well, first of all, there's no need to apologize for anything you said about like creating good content. Um, for me, like that's the way that I built my <coughs> business. I don't even really know much about SEO. Um, SEO to me is creating useful content with an intuitive interface that's useful for your visitors. I, don't, I mean, that's, that's to me the first point. It's been pretty successful. But one thing that's been really annoying recently is Google's Google Plus bump to all these people that have Google Plus accounts and their little picture shows up. Um, specifically in my industry, the, the about.com people are ranking high with a bunch of templated content that's totally worthless and Google doesn't seem to be aware of it. Um, what's your experience with that and any recommendations on how to combat what's going on with that right now? Thanks. Well, the, the I haven't been uh, on Google Plus for, I mean, probably less than an hour total. I, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time on there. I don't, you know, some of my clients have accounts there, but it's more just kind of a standard just, oh yeah, do that also, you know. Um, the the one thing that I have seen uh, people do that has been pretty successful that I haven't I haven't been doing currently for any of my own clients or anything like that but um, you know there's been a lot of talk about the author authorship link and getting you know having your Google Plus profile you know and having a like a author that writes and this kind of comes back to you know the people hacking aspect where it's like you know if you have that. Google Plus is, you know, giving some benefit to people who are using their system to identify them as an author and then, you know, get those links going. And if you write a bunch of quality articles that have enough interaction and all that kind of stuff, you know, you can get some pretty good links by just, you know, creating your own content and using Google Plus and all that. Um, as far as the other things go, I mean, I don't, um, 
it's like with about.com and sites like that, you know, it's just kind of how it is. There's going to be sites that rank that shouldn't that because they're big sites and they were built up and they have a ton of links and they, you know, they've been around for a long time and, you know, people know about, uh, you know, people know about.com. So, you know, it kind of makes sense that they rank, even though no one ever really likes getting an about old, result. Old, old links play by different rules. Right. Like that, that's what it comes down to. If a, if a site was on the internet in 2002, they have crappy links that do them good because those crappy links have existed for 10 right. years. It's um, like a grandfather, you know, they're just kind of grandfathered into the rankings and they'll be, they'll be around for a while, I imagine. You know, it's, but that's, you know, as far as combating that, um, you know, the, the only, I, I compete with Wikipedia a lot um, for a lot of the, ser you know, search terms that I have my clients ranking for and things. Wikipedia is a pretty common, you know, first place competitor for me. And uh, obviously, you know, everyone loves Wikipedia. It's a great site and all that. Um, so I, just to go back to social. So if you, un unfortunately, and th this, is, this is the truth, um, you know, Google's making it harder for smaller businesses, which I would consider, you know, affiliates to be smaller businesses. It's making it harder for them to compete against the big boys. So it's kind of like if you're in a space where you rank for brand names, um, let's say that you have a you know, computer comparison site and so you compare computers from all the big brand names. Well, once they start taking into social signals into account, the problem is, is that these big computer manufacturers have like 500,000 likes um, and you know, 100,000 followers on Twitter and it's, it's very hard for a small affiliate site to mimic that in a space with brands. And I, I have seen websites that we have that compete against brands that once social started coming into play um, and we put the social buttons on our site and it's like, hey, we've got 500 likes, which is more than any other affiliate site in the space, but nowhere near what the Fortune 50 companies, you know, that we, we feature information on have. Um, so that can be an issue. Unfortunately, it's one I don't really have a solution for yet. Um, like I said, old links play by different rules. That's just unfortunately the name of the game. We have people that come to us a lot and say, well, I have a competitor that ranks on nothing but reciprocal links. And it's like, yeah, but your competitor has been online since 2001. So unfortunately, they're 11 year old reciprocal links. Um, and then the other thing is, is where Kenny was talking about, was it, which one of you said authorship? I did. So Kenny was talking about authorship. Um, so going out and finding people that have strong Google Plus followings and getting them to do a guest post somehow make it, I'm not, I'm not saying to pay them because I'm sure that's going to be the new buying links, um, but you know, somehow making it worth their while to post on your website and getting them then to put it, you know, the, the link to their site and basically lend their authorship credibility. Um, for instance, I bought a site from Mike years ago um, and Mike is very well known in the, the mobile marketing space, so he writes a lot on it. So the first thing I did was say once, you know, when I relaunched the site, we relaunched it under a new template and I said to Mike, hey, so uh, you know all those posts that you authored that are still on the blog? Can you uh, throw a link in your Google Plus profile so that I can get your picture showing up in there? So um, anytime that you can find ways to get credibility from other people, it gets you good content on your site too. Users get a good experience, but you know, it definitely doesn't hurt. If you, have, if you have the chance to get two writers on your site and one doesn't have a Google Plus profile and one has 3,000 people following, circling, whatever it is, um, then I would definitely take the, the person that actually has the, the presence. Absolutely. Thanks, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I wish I, it wasn't true, but I, I know. Thanks for the info. One quick thing, I don't wanna monopolize my time here, but the whole Google sitemaps deal, we just added those to our sites recently, and Google said it cannot hurt your ranking to publish a sitemap. Every site we did it for, our ranking dropped the same day that we published the sitemap. So if you can just, I'll leave it to him after this, but if you can just give a few words on why you should publish a sitemap and what you should include, like priority or dates or any of that, um, what you would recommend, that would be really helpful. Thanks. The reason uh, I like to, you know, do sitemaps, it's usually kind of the start is because, you know, then you get Google notified, here's all the pages that we, ha you know, have on our site that we want indexed. And it helps out with a, a lot with indexation. Um, the only time I've really seen a sitemap, you know, an XML sitemap help with rankings when that is in the case that there was a site that had strong pages that weren't yet indexed and I was able to put a sitemap up and then Google indexed the page and then it started ranking. But I haven't ever seen the sitemaps really add to rankings um, in terms of like, you know, boosting, you know, maybe priority terms that you're trying to rank for. But it is a good thing to do just because when you go through and uh, you know, if you're going to make changes to your site or update your content or, you know, keep pages alive and all that kind of stuff, 
every time you know you have the sitemap resubmitted, Google will go through and recrawl, and uh, you know a lot of times those things that you do to update those pages that you'd want to alert them of, you know, notifications and stuff will help your rankings. Um, it's I it's kind of weird to hear that it, your rankings drop. The only case where I can imagine rankings would drop after a sitemap is in the same case where there were maybe other pages that weren't indexed and now they are and now they're trying to sort out you know which pages they should rank where and, and whatnot but usually you know after a sitemap it's common to see some some fluctuation um, you know I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a trend either way but you know as they kind of figure out those new pages and, and get that new information you'll you'll definitely see fluctuations yeah I got I gotta say too like how many pages site we're talking about <laughs> Maybe 7,000. Okay, I, I would not, th this is just me personally. I feel like that if a site's less than 10,000 pages and it's built correctly with correct architecture, like there's no reason that I would submit a site map for a site that small. If you have a 100,000 page site, if you have a problem getting indexing, so let's say that you know you have 80,000 pages on your site but only 10,000 are being indexed in Google, which you just go into Google and hit site colon your domain name and it'll tell you about how many pages it thinks it has for you. So if you have way under what you should have, then I might go look at a sitemap. I also might look at your internal architecture to see why they're not logically crawling it and finding all the pages anyway. But maybe I'm just lazy, but um, I, just, I, 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 I think it's just, you know, they say For they have it, small. why not do it? It's not, I, you know, it's just not, I don't think it's a huge thing, but you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't, it's not like I would be like, oh my God, I can't believe you submitted a sitemap. It's just not <laughs> like on my checklist of things to do. It's like so, far down my checklist. Well, that's what it was for us forever. And then in Google Webmaster Tools, it's like, well, why haven't you submitted a sitemap? And everybody in SEO is like, well, where's your sitemap? And you need to submit the sitemap. And so we're fi we finally created a custom one and you know, with PHP and everything, and it, it's great. And then our ranking dropped. So how long ago was it that you, you submitted it? To not submit a sitemap? What's how that? long ago was it that you submitted it? Um, maybe a, like a month and a half. You should have figured it out. Yeah. By then, if it was a site map, like if it if it was an issue with the site map or if it was flux, yeah. they it should have figured like it out by then. It wasn't like we dropped 80%, but it was like 10%, which for us is a big deal because we're pretty consistent with our traffic. So, yeah, unfortunately, without looking at the site map, I I wouldn't be able to guess, venture a guess as to why okay. it dropped. I would still say it's correlation than causation. Yeah. It, it, I'm sorry. What? It's probably it's probably not related to the site map. Is you know. It, does, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that it would make you drop in rankings. I you know? totally agree. I just was curious if you guys had ideas and if you recommended sitemaps overall. So, I mean, it, it's possible. I mean, I, I would assume you created a brand new sitemap. So, I mean, it's possible if you submitted a sitemap with a shitload of four... If you submitted a sitemap with a crap load of 404s in it, et cetera, um, and you know, you're basically red herring in Google to like make them aware of all these pages that you want them to crawl and then the pages aren't there and yada, yada, yada. Um, but for, for the most part, it shouldn't have any effect on whether you, the only way that it should have an effect on whether or not you rank better, it won't even have an effect on you ranking better, it just has an effect on how many pages on your site are indexed. Right, okay. Yeah. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, Back in the day when Google had trouble uh, indexing uh, dynamic URLs, we switched to make our URLs look like they were static, and then we just used an odd even to substitute for each slash a ampersand and equal sign between them. Um, and I noticed now, and I've just kind of built the site continuing with that format because it's doing you know, well for us. So now the question is, is that negative because Google sees that as being to some sort of, okay. No, not at all. No, and I, I would never change your URL structure no, for no, the sake of keywords or not keywords or the, the you know, the, very rarely do I suggest to people that, that, especially if they have a ranking site, that they change their URL structure unless the URL structure is like completely messed up and illogical and horrible. Um, but no, if it's just a matter of like, no, that, Okay, yeah. so that, I think you kind of answered my second question. So um, I shouldn't be changing anything and I should stick with that, but also um, you wouldn't, if, you, if I was going to start over with a new site and, and do that, am I better off? Let me backtrack one second. I'm sorry. When you, you said uh, with one of the Panda or Penguin updates, I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, domain rich um, search engine. Term. You're talking about the EMD update, the exact match update. All right, what is that called? I'm sorry. Uh, EMD, it was the exa exact match domain. Okay. And what they were trying to do is hit sites that were ranking that were crap that just happened to have an so, exact match. So if you have a domain and then, you know, some parameters after the domain, is it still important to, to include the terms that you want at the end of the, after the domain? 
I'm, I, or is like, that not affected in, because in your URLs? Language? You mean? Are you talking about just like is it is it effective to put keywords in your URL? Is that what you're asking? Right, but not even in the domain, but in the URL. Yeah, yeah in the yeah yeah, in, yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely. It, it, you want it to be right. basically you want it your URLs. You want the let's say you're three or four levels deep. The best kind of you know. I guess way to estimate is is it human discernible? So if you have you know site.com slash category slash dresses slash red dresses, does that make can you read it and does it make sense to you? And that's basically what you should be looking for in your URLs in the best case scenario, so that they're legible to a human to understand the categorization of that you've taken to go through your site. Much like you would use breadcrumbs on a site to see where you are, your URL should be reflect that same kind of simplicity and you know relevancy but if we already previously had a lot of um, numerical values in there you wouldn't what you if I was building your, a brand new site I would do it exactly right. the way that, that right. Kenny but said it doesn't pay to backtrack and do that no no okay. no 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 it, it doesn't have it, keywords in your URL not in your URL don't have that much of an effect that you would <laughs> go back and redo it and then do all the 301 redirects to tell all the search engines there's new pages um, right. yeah I, the only thing I would say though is just like Kenny's like just short and sweet you don't want you know we have um, like uh, one of my sites is about Blackberry and if we have a folder Blackberry slash apps you know slash you do not want it to be you know buy Blackberry slash free Blackberry games for Pearl slash you know your directory so just make them short and sweet and right. simple um, and one other question regarding anchor text is that only applied to external sites linking to you as far as your internal linking goes no that counts also <coughs> Absolutely. So you want to have your your strongest, you know, cornerstone pages. You want to be linking to those the most from yourself, from all the other auxiliary pages with the phrases that are most relevant for those pages. But you don't want to just be like because you have control of it. You don't just want to put those links everywhere. Is again, it needs to be it needs to make sense, right? Is there a reason for there to, you to be linking to these other pages outside of just in your navigation and things like that? Right, but I think before you th somebody had thrown out a fifty percent figure as far oh, as oh that's no that's a different yeah I'm talking about external that's links. external links only all right so that's okay that's that was what yeah 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 was. thank you very much uh -huh. we get a much better response with any content that we create on our site if we use an image um, you know putting on Facebook uh, even putting it on Pinterest we're getting huge results traffic wise with Pinterest so. Uh, usually, you know, I'll try to use stock photography that I pi that I buy, but uh, occasionally I'll do the Google image thing and put it on the content. So I'm wondering, what are the uh, SEO risks, if any, of using an image that's somewhere else, just using the same thing, giving it a different file name, and then what are the legal? The also? It, really, it's not the SEO you have to worry about. It's the legal part where you know you could potentially have people file DMCA against you, you know, violation of copyright, whatever. So. Um, you know what I what I've done in the past, like for blog posts and stuff, is I'll just use <laughs> Flickr, but I'll go to Creative Commons, and then as long as you link back to them, um, you know, link back to the original cr creator of the content, you know, you're totally legal and all of that. Um, but yeah, really, you know, it's kind of one of those, you know, risk reward. You need to as assess that yourself. Like, is is using these images for free that you shouldn't be using worth it? Because if your site gets enough traffic. Someone's going to notice, and then you might have problems. You know, so I generally would just say, you know, create your own images or buy them or something like that. You know, if you're planning on building a site that has, you know, a quality readership, and you know, you're trying to grow in a legitimate way. So the one one more thing, it can affect you somewhat SEO wise, but exactly what Kenny said, DMCA. If they, if they file a DMCA with Google, right. Google will remove the page from your search results. Um, so you want to be careful that you can get sued over it. Uh, I know that like my liability insurance on on my company. Um, one of the reasons that it's high is because we use images, and the the liability the insurance company is constantly afraid that you know anybody that uses that anybody that blogs with images is going to get sued for copyright. Yada yada yada. So um, you know, I'd be more worried about it legally though than I right. would SEO wise. Also, I know stock photography is expensive. There is a site called photospin.com. Um, they have a subscription every year. I think it's like $340, $350, but it's unlimited images. So it's not eye stock quality as in like, you know, it's not going to be anything that makes you, ooh, ah. Um, but for, for it, like, I, it has millions of images and 
I'm able to use it for most of the stuff that we need to. And then we just splurge on the high stock photos every once in a while when we have a piece we know we're going to push really, really hard. So um, if that's part of the reason that you're doing it is because of the expense of stock photography, look into Photospin. Um, I did a review on it on my site, so it has all the, the information on it. But um, I, I would look into that. I've been with them for like three years now, and I'm really, really happy with them. And it's not tiny images either. You can get the images in any side, unlimited downloads, yeah. Cool. So. Because that was my follow-up. What are some good alternatives? So, so photo spin. Photo spin. Um, any others that you can recommend? Uh, there, well, I mean, the other ones. The problem with the other ones is they're expensive. At some point, iStock Photo decided that they basically had Picasso um, and decided to start charging like you know I'm exaggerating, but a million dollars per picture. Um, so I stopped well, using the, them a long time ago. That's what all the I have some photographer buddies that it gets real expensive. You know, charge three, four thousand dollars an image easy. But. Yeah. All right, we only got a couple minutes left, so let's try and get these last couple questions. Uh, just a couple, uh, couple quick questions. One, um, for an affiliate site using video, uh, whether you make your own video or you're using something from um, YouTube, just putting, you know, embedding a link to something that's related, uh, any thoughts of that? And so. I, I would recommend, uh, I've, you know, you can get really good conversions and uh, all that as an affiliate if you make your own videos, especially if you're doing like reviews and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's really not that hard to create your own videos to put up rather than, you know, trying to find videos or whatever. Um, but I don't know. And, and are you saying, uh, is the next layer to your question as well, self-hosting it or are you, you putting it on YouTube and embedding it? Because that, that's still a debate. Right, so, so I'll look for, a, for something that maybe the company did for the product, and they, and they put the video up there, and so you just take it and embed it into your review. I think you'd, you'd probably have a, a lot better performance-wise if you created your own videos, you know, and had that unique video content, because people want to see that, you know, and they don't, people don't, pref you know, people prefer to watch the content from where it came from rather than some other site that's reposting it. A lot of times, you know, Personally, me as a user, if I find some video posted somewhere, I want to find out where it came from. Because if I find where it came from, then if I like the content of the video, you gotta go there, right. right, exactly. Make sure you're using markup on the video, too, so that if you are publishing videos on your pages, you're getting a little snippet in Google that shows the video. Um, there's, uh, and it's, it's paid, I apologize. I don't know an easy way to do it other than this plugin, but uh, Yoast.com, Y-O-A-S-T.com, he has a video plug-in thingy that automatically adds all the markup to your videos and to your templates, yada, 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 and gives you little images and Google, yeah. and I think it's like $75 or something like that, but you can use it on unlimited sites. So if you have 30 affiliate sites, you would only need to buy one copy of it, and you can use it on whatever. And I apologize, but I'm just going to go to the next question because okay. that's going to be the last one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll try to make it quick. So I'm a publisher. I have a single <laughs> website that... Alexa is about 1,200, gets a tremendous amount of traffic, ranks, about th ranks third for the coveted keywords, two and three. Trying to bump Are you to just that. bragging? <laughs> no. I'll talk to you afterwards. I'm curious, you know, first of all, I know very little about SEO. Um, it's five or six pages on the website totally. There's probably a lot of things I'm missing. My question is this. What can I expect to pay for good? You know, the problem is when I've, when I've gone online and looked for SEO, everyone claims they can do everything for you. You know, so weeding out, obviously you guys are experts who wouldn't be here, um, but what can you also expect to pay per month for? I, I can tell you that anybody that charges $500 a month or less probably is waste. not doing a, I don't right. want to say a waste, I don't want to say a waste. If you're, if you're a, a lawn maintenance company in, you know, then yes, you might be getting something decent sure. for that, but if you're in any so type local, of competitive right. niche, I, I don't know <coughs> what somebody would be doing for, yeah. for that amount or, or less per month. Um, a lot of it has to do with our, to be honest with you, it completely varies. Um, based on the vertical, on, based on the reach. It, right. Exactly, because okay. like, say credit cards, very, very competitive. So right. SEO companies are going to charge more because it's much harder to rank in. It takes much more work. It takes much more hours per month versus if you sell custom knit lace doilies. Yeah. Um, that's well, a little bit Well, this website monetizes there. purely not on CPA, but on banner displays through third-party ad networks. So there's mm -hmm. no user, you know, the thing that You just need more page views and... and like, are you saying you just need more page views? Page, yeah, exactly. Page views drives revenue, exactly, on my side. So moving up, that's the Honestly, reason. then, depending on your topic, I may put more money into social media yeah, than I would to SEO. Sure. We have half a million Facebook likes. Right, but I'm yeah, saying I, if, I, if I were going to take a, a, a budget and you already ranked number three for your core keywords, right. I, 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 I may try and do a little more with, with social. Okay. That, that would be my gut instinct if okay. it were my site. I'd like to talk to you guys offline, off so. 
Um, so I just want to thank everybody for coming in and seeing us today. If you guys have any questions, you can hit us up on Twitter. Um, Kenny is at Kenny Heider. Uh, Mike is, Jesus, I hate, hit, Mike is at mobile underscore underscore Martin. Um, and then I'm um, at Sugar Ray with an E. So, uh, Go Patriots. Very, used to say yeah, that no. <laughs> thanks very much for coming in today, guys. Thanks, we hope guys. you have a good rest of the conference. Oh, and mark, mark your, your, your feedback cards because they're going to yell at me otherwise for forgetting to ask you until just now. <laughs>